Well, you are listening to Meeting House here on Faith Radio. Author Frank Viola is spending some time with us as we talk about the new book, God's Favorite Place on Earth. It releases today, and uh, we'll tell you more about the book and uh, some special opportunities here. But you're talking about God's favorite place on Earth, and you're zeroing in on this little town of Bethany. And you laid it out very nicely just a few moments ago about the ways that Jesus was rejected during his earthly ministry. But he knew he could go to Bethany and find a place of, well, we might say solid or refuge. What was it about Bethany, and I guess more specifically the relationship that he had with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha that were especially meaningful to him? You know what? They knew how to receive Jesus Christ. One of the passages in Luke says, and there was a woman named Martha and her sister Mary, and they received him into their home. And they knew how to welcome him. And what I do in the book is I talk about how to properly receive Jesus Christ. See, here's the problem today. All Christians think they have received Jesus Christ. And in one sense, we all have. But, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. To receive Christ is to receive all that he is. For example, some Christians receive Jesus as the justifier of their sins, but then they reject him as the justice giver. Hmm. Uh, By contrast, some will emphasize his role of bringing justice to the world, and they're into social justice, but then they downplay the fact that he is the Savior and justifier of all sins and all sinners. And uh, another thing we can do is, he said, he who receives me receives the Father, and he who receives you, talking to his disciples, receives me. Paul said, therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Well, to receive a person whom Christ has received is to receive Jesus himself. And what happens today in Christianity is sometimes, well, we we like these Christians, we like their beliefs, we like their doctrines, we like the way they worship, but these other Christians here, well, you know, we really don't agree with them, this and that, and we really don't receive them. We end up rejecting them. And this is where a lot of hurt and pain comes from fellow Christians. And I want your listeners to know, Bob, that if they buy the book this week, from May 1st to May 7th, we are going to give them 25 free books by 15 different authors as a reward for ordering it on release week. And these are not cheapo books. Let me tell you, these are bona fide, published by real Christian publishers, by best-selling authors. <laughs> 25, they just have to go to godsfavoriteplace.com, and all the information will be there on how they can get God's Favorite Place on Earth and the 25 free books. But they have to order before May 7th. They have a week. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Well, and I'm curious uh, with respect to how you developed this whole concept as you looked into Bethany. What kind of drew you there? What was the, the impetus here? The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not arranged chronologically, and even the stories within them, they're not chronological. And so many years ago, I started looking at the Bible chronologically. I wanted to find out, okay, what happened exactly in order? I ended up writing a book called The Untold Story of the New Testament Church that blends together the book of Acts and all of Paul's epistles, as well as the other letters in the New Testament, and told it as a story. And, you know, at different points in the book of Acts, I would say, okay, Paul is here, and this is when he writes Galatians. So you can kind of see the whole sweeping narrative of the New Testament in one fell swoop, and you can get a feeling for when things happen. Well, when I did that with the Gospels, I saw that Jesus made trips to Bethany, and those trips lasted all throughout his life, where, as I said before, he spent the last week of his life in Bethany. And what's interesting about that, Bob, is he would not sleep in the city of Jerusalem. He would not spend the night there. He would spend the day there, the last Mm -hmm. week of his life, and then he'd retreat to Bethany where he would find rest and solace and welcome and hospitality. Then he would get up in the morning with his disciples and they'd go into the city of Jerusalem. The only time he spent a night in Jerusalem was when he was crucified. And so I put it all together, and I had the help of other people. I've had other scholars look at this and help me with some of the details of the history behind it. And I just was able to, with God's help, blend together a very moving, gripping story 
of this little village of Bethany that many Christians aren't aware of. You know, one of the endorsers of the book, Phil Cook, says, I got a Ph.D. in theology, (laughs) and I have never seen this narrative of the little village of Bethany and how important it was to the Lord. And I can say the same thing myself, although I don't have a Ph.D. in theology. I'm not even a registered nurse, Bob, uh, let alone a doctor. (laughs) But um, it really, really was something that was arresting and beautiful and gives a real message to Christians to help them in the journey of life and following the Lord. Well, Frank Viola has been joining us today here on The Meeting House on Faith Radio. It is release week for the new book, God's Favorite Place on Earth, and we're talking about events in the city of Bethany, some 18 issues that Christians struggle with as seen uh, through the eyes of Lazarus as you put it into a narrative form here. So when people think about the city of Bethany, probably a couple of things come to mind Lazarus and his resurrection, that's one of them. And then, of course, the story of Mary and Martha, as as Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha was circulating around trying to get ready for Jesus. And I understand that in this book, you actually present a, a bit of a unique take on this particular story. For many years, I was taught this, and I think many of your listeners were taught this. Mary is the very spiritual contemplative woman, you know, she's too heavenly minded to be too earthly good, you know. She doesn't really care about helping her sister out in the kitchen, so they have this kitchen fight. And Martha's the opposite, you know, she is the activist. You know, she's the one that's down to earth. She's too earthly minded to be too heavenly good, you know. And so we're taught, well, everybody needs a little bit of Mary and everybody needs a little bit of Martha. Well, that's really not accurate. When you look at the text carefully and you look at the stories carefully, You never find Mary rebuked for anything. She's not corrected. In fact, two times Jesus defends her. And the second thing is, Mary is a very practical woman. And I bring this out in the book, but uh, she was there with Martha helping her in the kitchen the whole time, except at the end when Jesus went into the living public room His disciples were with him, and they all sat down together, because this is what disciples did. They sat down at the feet of the rabbi. They're sitting on the floor. Jesus is teaching. There's only men in there, and Mary does something arresting. She leaves the kitchen area, which really was the courtyard of that day, and she goes into the public room, and she takes a seat with the other disciples. This is a, an elephant sticking out in the room. This is a woman sitting in the public room, and that day women yeah. were not allowed to be in there. Mm-hmm. And secondly, this is a woman sitting at the feet of a rabbi, of a Jewish teacher. That was unheard of. It was scandalous. And so Martha was really angry because her sister was acting like a man. Hmm. And Jesus, of course, defends Mary and gives a very gentle rebuke to Martha. And we see Martha's change throughout the narratives of Bethany. And by the very end, when her sister Mary takes a flask of fine perfume, very costly, and pours it on the head and the feet of Jesus, Martha is there, and she has no word of criticism. She's still serving, but she's not doing it in her own flesh. She has been transformed by Jesus Christ. And so every Martha I have ever met, you know, people who are just so active, they're so busy that they eventually burn out, and they love the Lord, but they're doing all this in their own energy. Every Martha I have ever met oftentimes becomes a Mary, and every Mary I have ever met used to be a Martha. So it's a really great story, and it speaks to all of us. You know, these two women were great, and Jesus loved them. The New Testament says over and over again how Jesus loved Lazarus, how he loved Mary, and her sister Martha. There was a special place in his heart for this family and for the little village of Bethany. And again, the book shows us how to be a Bethany for Jesus in this day and in this hour. Mm. Well, some great insight for us today. Frank Viola spending some time here on The Meeting House on Faith Radio. Releasing today, it's God's Favorite Place on Earth. And, Frank, if people go to GodsFavoritePlace.com, don't put that apostrophe in there, by the way, when you type in the address to your browser, but GodsFavoritePlace.com, what can they find there? 
Yeah, well, they will find all sorts of neat stuff about the book, including a video trailer, which is very short, but it looks like one of those movie trailers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really amazing. And you hear Lazarus talking 30 years later after Jesus raised him from the dead. And it's a great introduction to the book. They will also find that if they order the book between May 1st and May 7th, they will receive 25 free books and audios. I will have the whole list of everybody who's involved in that, all the authors, and they will get that as a free reward. We want as many people as possible to buy the book on May 1st to May 7th because it will help the book become visible to more and more Christians. And I really believe that this will help so many believers. It's helped me. The message has helped me. That's why Hmm. I wrote it. Frank, exclamation point of our conversation, 60 seconds or less. What's the takeaway? What would you want Christians to take from this particular book? The big takeaway is that they're going to close the back of the book and say, What a Lord. Mm. I have never seen Jesus like this in my life, and I know what he wants. All the stuff that I've been taught all the years as a Christian, you got to do this, you got to do that. God wants this, God wants that. You know, if you put it all in a notebook, you know, you'd have a thousand pages of three million things to do. This book juices it down to one thing God in Christ is looking for a Bethany in your heart, in your church. He wants a place to lay his head. And in that vision of being a Bethany, I want to be a Bethany for my Lord. He was rejected everywhere else, but now here in me, he can find a home. They will find the answer to so many struggles that we Christians deal with especially when we go through hard times. You know, when we go through the storms of life, we want an explanation, but God wants to give us a revelation Mm. of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what the book is all about. Well, Frank Viola joining us today, one of America's top 10 Christian bloggers. GodsFavoritePlace.com is the website address. Welcome to ChristianBook.com. My name is Amy Courage, and today we are speaking with author Frank Viola. We're going to be talking about his newest book, God's favorite place on earth. And Frank, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. It's always an honor to be on. Great. Now, what motivated you um, to write this particular story, this, this you know, sto- story of faith? Well, a couple things. First, the story of Jesus in the little village of Bethany has always intrigued me. And I wanted to put it all in chronological order because it's all spread out through the Gospels. But it's such a powerful narrative within the New Testament that I wanted to bring it all out and tell it from beginning to end and just to put it in bold relief so we can see it. The other thing that motivated it is that the message of that story of Jesus in Bethany, a little village of Bethany, changed my own life in many different ways. And uh, as I say on the website for the book, GodsFavoritePlace.com, it addresses 18 specific struggles that we Christians have. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share that message with others because it was so powerful and formative in my own life, and I found it to be transformative. I wanted to share it with others, uh, hoping it would have the same effect. Great. And could you give us um, a bit of a summary of the book's content and explain the meaning of the title for us? God's favorite place on earth, you know, it raises a question, I'm sure, in in the minds of readers, you know, well, what is that? And how do you know that? (laughs) What is God's favorite place on earth and how can we be sure? We know that Jesus of Nazareth is the human face of God. When God decided to show up on planet earth, he took form in the person of Christ, and we call that the Incarnation. So Jesus is God in flesh. And as soon as Jesus entered into the planet, he was rejected from the womb to the tomb, actually. Uh, He was rejected in Bethlehem when he came to be born. You know, there was no room for him there, so he had to be born where animals were fed. Then when he's two years old, he's being hunted like an animal by Herod. Then we're told that his brothers and sisters did not believe in him. And then we're told that his hometown, his own hometown where he grew up, Nazareth, rejected him. You know, remember that the scripture says that he could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And Jesus made a big statement where he said, A prophet has honor except 
in his own home. And then, you know, he, he wants to go to Samaria, and they reject him there, and that's when John and James wanted to bring fire down from heaven because <laughs> they rejected Jesus. And then finally, Jerusalem, which was the place where God put his name. It's where the temple was. It's the holy city. They not only reject him, but they crucify him. Jesus made the statement, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. John says he came to his own, and his own received him not. So with all of this universal rejection, we have a little glimmer of light. There was only one place that totally and completely and properly received Jesus Christ, it was his home, it was a place where he could lay his head, and it was a little village two miles away from Jerusalem called Bethany. Mm. So that's what the book is about. It's about God's favorite place on earth, what it is, what it means. What God is looking for today is that each and every one of us be a Bethany for him a spiritual Bethany, that we be a Bethany for Christ, a place where he can lay his head and find rest and be at home, and every church would be a Bethany, and that is the call of the book, and that's what the book unfolds. Mm. Great. And also, I was just wondering, out of my own curiosity, um, where did the uh, picture on the front cover come from? I think it's a very beautiful illustration that looks like, you know, it could be Bethany. Um, it, absolutely, it is. That is a picture of ancient Bethany, according to historians and artists. And so you're actually looking at the little village, a photograph of it. Nice. Nice. It's a lovely picture. Thanks. I just, I just really like it. Um, you know, I haven't heard any uh, comments on the cover, so you're the first. Oh, so I'm okay. glad you liked it. <laughs> oh, I like it a lot. So, um, And getting back to the book, how are the typical caricatures of Mary and Martha wrong? And what do you think that they can teach us today? Historically, and even up until this good day, Mary is depicted as too heavenly-minded to be earthly good. You know, she's the spiritual, mystic, contemplative, quietist Christian. And then Martha is, you know, the activist and the busy bee, and she's too earthly-minded to be any spiritual good. <laughs> and so, you know, they kind of represent the two opposites. People will say either one of two things. They'll just say, we need to move to the middle. Everybody needs a little Martha and everybody needs a little Mary. Or they'll say, all the Marthas in the church, you know, God loves them all and they need to just be what they are. And all the Marys in the church need to be what they are. And there you have it. But I think this is totally wrong. When you look at the accounts in the Gospels, which I do in the book, you find that Martha is a very giving, caring, serving person. And that's to be commended. But in the very beginning of the narratives, she's too absorbed with her work, you know. Mm -hmm. She's burning out. And because she's so tied to it, she's being critical of other people. And that's what happens when we Christians focus on our ministry or what we think God should be doing, and we're all wrapped up in it to where it becomes our identity. We start judging and criticizing other people because they're not doing enough. Right. And that's what was happening with Martha. But the thing about it is Jesus transformed her, and by the very end of the story, Bethany, that you see no hint of that. She's still serving, but she doesn't have that judgmental attitude, and she's not troubled about her work and worried and frustrated. She's doing it from another place, and God has affected something. Mary, on the other hand, she's not this contemplative, mystic, quietest Christian who is not practical at all and doesn't want to help with practical and earthly things. That's not true at all. She was helping Martha in the kitchen when Jesus came to visit Bethany. Mm -hmm. The scripture is clear. What she did do, however, is that as soon as Jesus began teaching, some point after he began teaching in the public room, the disciples were there, obviously. She left Martha and went and sat at the feet of Jesus and took her place as a disciple. Right. And what was so astounding about that is that in that day, only men were to be in the public room. And Jewish rabbis only had women 
to be their disciples. So this was unheard of. I mean, she was breaking two cardinal rules of that day. You know, one, you're a woman, you don't go in the public room. And two, how dare you be a disciple of a Jewish rabbi by taking your place at his feet like the men, because that's reserved for men. And here's the thing. Jesus never criticized her for it. Right. He actually defended her when Martha was all up in arms because she was acting like a man when she should be acting like a woman and be there in the kitchen, Jesus defended her. And she was criticized again later on by the disciples, even, and Jesus defended her again. So Mary of Bethany is my hero. Two great defenses of her from Jesus. And then beyond that, Jesus said everywhere the gospel is to be preached, her story of what she did is to be heralded and proclaimed. This woman is to be honored wherever the gospel is preached. Mm -hmm. And so for the last 2,000 years, Mary has been spoken well of by Christians who bring the good news. Now, that makes me want to be a Mary. Mm -hmm. And here's the interesting thing. Every Mary I have ever met, meaning, you know, taking upon themselves the spirit and the attitude and the love for Christ that Mary had, used to be a Martha. Mm -hmm. They just burned out. <laughs> right, right and uh, found the Lord in a higher way. Right. And um, what do you see as uh, being the major problems that many Christians today struggle with, and, and how is your book addressing those, those problems? I give a, a listing of 18 specific struggles that Christians have uh, because I've had them <laughs> mm -hmm. and wrestled with them and found some discoveries of the Lord that helped me through them and helped me overcome and solve them. And so all this is in the book. Here's the thing. We have to find the Lord in a new way, in a fresh way, to solve any problem. And what I do in, in the book through the message of Bethany, Jesus in Bethany, is bring out how these problems were solved. I won't rattle off all 18, but I'll just mention a few of them. How do you gain God's peace and presence in the midst of your worst storm? How do you truly forgive and release people who've rejected you, especially fellow Christians? Right. If they've unjustly criticized you or if they have treated you terribly, how do you keep from getting bitter? How do you learn how to live life without fear of anything? How do you trust God when he doesn't meet your expectations or he doesn't appear to fulfill his promises? You know, these are real issues we face that challenge us. And so in the book, I address them as I tell the story of Bethany. And, of course, as you know, the book tells the story of Jesus and Bethany through the eyes of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Thirty years after he was raised from the dead, he's now getting ready to die, and he tells the story. So there's a bit of a fictional element in it, but it stays very close to the biblical text and really brings it into 3D life, at least that's what I'm told. And, you know, I want to say, too, that if listeners get the book between May 1st and May 7th, they can go to godsfavoriteplace.com and they will be rewarded with 25 free audios and books by 15 different authors, just as a thank you for getting it on release week. We want people to buy it then only because it would become more visible to Christians everywhere if a lot of folks get it then. Great. Yeah. That's a great little add-on. Yeah, and these are valuable books and audios. It's not cheap stuff. You know, people think, well, if it's free, it's not valuable. Well, not the case here, <laughs> as they'll see. Great. And what has the reaction um, to the book been so far? What have been people saying? We've had a number of early readers, and it's really interesting because a good bit of them said that this made Jesus so real to me. That's a humbling and very honoring thing to hear as an author. The other thing that a lot of folks said, even grown men, uh, quite a few grown men said it made them weep, mm. certain parts of it. I've heard that numerous times. So that's another thing that, you know, is humbling to hear. When I hear stuff like that, Amy, I just think, you know, it's beyond my ability to write something like this. That was definitely the Holy Spirit coming through my pen. But we have 47 Christian authors, many of whom are best-selling authors, have recommended the book. That's quite a lot. And if people are interested in who they are, you know, they can go to godsfavoriteplace.com and see them all. Uh, but, you know, we have John Ortberg and John Acuff and Mary DeMuth and Greg Boyd and Leonard Swede and just a whole bunch of men and women who have pastors and leaders and teachers and seminary professors who have just weighed in on what they think of the book. I was really blessed to read all that. Great. Great. And um, in, 
in conclusion, is there anything else that you would like to share um, with your readers? Yeah, sure. I, I will just say this. You know, I've written 14 books to date, and this one I regard to be my life's work. If they want to really see what has changed my life in terms of the Christian message, message of the Lord. It's what's in this book. I would say it's the shortest book I've ever written to, and it's uh, it's the easiest to read. You know, one person said, I read it in a little under two hours, <laughs> the whole thing, from cover to cover. So it's mm -hmm. a quick read. And I guess the other thing is, if people go to godsfavoriteplace.com, they'll see a video trailer, they'll see a book sampler, they'll see where they can get the book. They'll also get the 25 free audios and books from 15 different authors if they grab a copy between May 1st and May 7th. I'm also accessible to answer questions and talk to people via my blog, which is at the same place, godsfavoriteplace.com. And I love to talk to readers and fellow believers. Always love learning from God's people. Great. Great. Well, Frank, thank you so much for taking this time to chat with us today. And I hope that um, our listeners will take a look at God's favorite place on earth. And thank right. you. Thank you so much.